Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good whatever time you are listening to this podcast. My name is James Alban and you are listening to The Last Line. I hope you're all having a wonderful week. Thank you very much for joining me. If you're new to the show, then please do hit subscribe on iTunes and at whatever podcast service that you listen to. We are on many a podcast service now, including a new edition Spotify. Exciting, isn't it? Very, 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 very exciting. And if you're feeling extra generous, then you can head over to patreon.com forward slash the last line and give me some of your money. That would be nice of you, but you don't have to. This week, we chat to Jack Burke of Australian band City Calm Down. City Calm Down hail from Melbourne, Australia and have two studio albums, uh, their first being In a Restless House and their second Echoes in Blue. Now, I've been a bit obsessed with the music of City Calm Down. I can't stop listening to their albums. I was very pleased when Jack agreed to chat to me backstage before his gig at the London Borderline. In our conversation, we covered everything from what it's like to make money as an artist, how Jack deals with having a full-time job and uh, keeping his music career going. But first, I ask him about the band's tour and how the Australian government have helped with partially funding it. You, th- this tour was, uh, am I right in saying this tour was like funded by like the Australian? Yeah, partly, yeah. Because a thing you see like quite often over here is like the arts are like, mm. like very, like mm. get slowly getting more and more underfunded. Yeah. So uh, I was going to ask if that was the same as in Australia, but it doesn't sound like that's the case. Yeah, it's, it's a funny one. There's been over the last sort of five or 10 years, a lot of lobbying from arts organisations around funding for the arts because all the capital cities in Australia, first and foremost, really far away from each other. So if you want to do a tour in Australia and you want to play three capital cities, the easiest three to play are Melbourne City and Sydney and Brisbane. And Sydney is 900 kilometres from Melbourne and Brisbane is, say, 1,300, 1,400 k's from Sydney. So you can't just jump in a van. Bands do do that, and we've done that in the past, but in terms of trying to earn a living, it's not really practical to drive 30 hours to Brisbane for one show that might sure, pay yeah. you 500 bucks. So it's really difficult for bands to just get off the ground, and then when it comes to international touring, Australia's a really long way away from everywhere. Anywhere. <laughs> yeah. So to come over here and do a tour is, is very expensive, and, and I guess at some stage... Someone who had control of the pot of money said, well, if we want Australian bands to succeed overseas, which is, I guess, important culturally, yeah. um, we need to help them out a little bit. So they only fund you if you're making a loss on a tour and, and they won't fund the whole thing. So you've got to say, we'll put in this much money and then they'll put in usually right. maybe like 50% is usually a good outcome if they'll chip in 50%. Um, yeah, which is which is great, um, and the, but then on the other side of you know if you live in Melbourne now, and the same in Sydney, it's really expensive to pay rent, and so there's this whole other conversation that's going on about if you want an an arts community, they pretty much got you to live, you've got to live yeah. out in the country now. Like yeah, well, Mel- it's like here, it's like if you, you know if you want to be an artist in London, like mm. how you're supposed to afford London prices. Like, yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's the it's the same. You know, Melbourne and Sydney are up there with London and Paris in terms of median wages to the cost of housing. And, yeah. um, Sydney's a lot worse than Melbourne. Melbourne's still got a bit of a a vibe about it, but at the rate at which it's changing, that will be you know, very different in five or 10 years. So yeah, there'll be another conversation uh, (laughs) happen then, I guess, when everyone will be like, oh, I can't can't afford my rent. (laughs) It's just just like, that's what the perennial uh, issue for musicians and and artists. But yeah, yeah. Um, 
I saw you you did an interview with uh, the Independent. Yeah. And uh, you mentioned something about Sydney having a like a liquor, some sort of new liquor law, which is like really affecting live yeah. music venues. Yeah. So what they did, there, there's been this whole kind of political brouhaha around late night violence, so drunken violence at nightclubs. Right. And what they did to try and curtail that is essentially remove any incentive for anyone to go out after midnight. So I don't know the specifics, but essentially they can't serve proper drinks after, say, midnight, and and everywhere closes at around 2 a.m. So if you leave after 2 a.m., you're locked out. And what that's done is it's... You know, Sydney's... Have you been to Sydney? No, I've never been to Australia. All right, well... Mel- Melbourne's similar, far, but Sydney <laughs> is a massive city. So right. you can be living in Sydney and it can take you an hour and a half to get into the city. Like the CBD, you're still in Sydney, out yeah. in Western Sydney, Parramatta, Blacktown, maybe even two hours now with the traffic. And so if you're a, a kid who wants to go out in the CBD, you're not going to venture all the way to the CBD yeah. to essentially stop getting served drinks at midnight. And so all these venues have just started closing down and it's already quite hard for live music venues to make make a living because they've got you know noise restrictions and all this stuff going on so um yeah all these live venues in sydney have closed down and when did that when did it kick in it would have been two or three maybe even more three or four years ago when they started imposing these new regulations and yeah if you if you're a young band and you want to go up to play a show in sydney there aren't many places to play anymore they all just shut up shop there was a place that we played two or three years ago when we were sort of on the first record that's now gone. And I think the thing is, once they shut down, yeah. it's not like well, there's something that's going to pop up in its place. You lose all this knowledge and, and the the institution itself is is lost. So then another you know, institution has to slowly take its place if that's ever going to happen. And they have slightly changed the laws now, and as, as I understand it, to try and be a bit more like Melbourne, which has small bar capacities okay but the um there's a big like clubs culture in sydney where you've got these massive clubs that might hold two thousand people and they're full of pokies machines and that they lobby the government to keep the licensing it or you can have a license if you're a two thousand person club but it's not affordable if you're a a small place whereas melbourne's been a bit more stratified the licensing laws so you can have a 50 person bar or a 5,000 person venue sure anyway that's a little long winded dance <laughs> all the all the stuff that's going on in Australia that affects uh, whether you can play a gig or not and then um, you were talking just before we started recording uh, with my dad who's in the room um, uh, about about radio play and about how Australian radios have to meet a quota of Australian artists that yeah. they but you? Yeah, uh, so the commercial radio stations have a 25% quota and then the government funded stations, so Triple J and ABC, Triple J is part of ABC, but they have to play 50% Australian music right? Um, and they do a great job of promoting Australian artists, whereas the commercial radio stations will play 25% Australian music, but they'll play it, you know, graveyard shift and it'll be legacy rock acts yeah. or pop acts. So plenty of Kylie Minogue and Jimmy Barnes, you know, not, not there's anything <laughs> wrong with them, but they are definitely not championing new Australian artists. It's not sure part of their, well, they're not incentivized to do it, but they apparently some, uh, a university did a study recently where they found that they aren't, they aren't even playing the 25%. So someone listened to radio for, say, a month and made a note of, you know, how many songs were played, how many of them were straight right. and were like, uh, you're not even doing it. And um, so now it's sort of, it's come up again and the, there's, you know, a bit of a brouhaha going around. But there's also a bit of a problem with Spotify because all the playlists are curated out of, say, the United States and the UK. Australia's charts are just getting flooded with international acts so even the most some of the most successful australian artists will struggle to break into the australian charts now because yeah 
because they can't get onto yeah. these Spotify playlists. And um, so there's now a conversation popping up about whether there needs to be local music quotas for the streaming services. So okay. it's very interesting to see how that develops. Yeah, Spotify has become a bit of a theme on the podcast. Like, I think uh, you're, you're probably the third... Oh yeah, of my guests to mention spot. I mean, uh, I had a singer on called Tom Williams. Okay, and it probably about twenty minutes of the podcast. Is yeah, yeah. Ranting about Spotify. Yeah. What did he think about it? Oh, he, he he went on a massive rant about how just how it, you know it's so difficult for an artist that's not Ed Sheeran or yeah. Taylor Swift yeah to make any money off Spotify yeah and how you you know how is a, an artist supposed to make any money when people just go to Spotify mm. and then it's hard to get discovered on Spotify and then yeah. when you do get discovered you're getting 0.0, 0, 0 yeah. of a cent or whatever it yeah, is. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, it's just interesting that it's, yeah. it's become a bit of a, uh, a theme. Yeah, it's a... So yeah. I don't even have Spotify, so it's kind of... Well, I, I have Spotify and if you're a consumer, it is the best it's amazing like you can just you know pull up a record and listen to it anything you want yeah. maybe you know, they don't have everything but they've got almost everything most people want to listen to which is fantastic um but it it sort of I wonder whether it affects the way people listen to music and the the type of music that it incentivizes people to make I think this is one of the whole things that maybe it doesn't get spoken about that much is is everyone responds to incentives and you artists might say oh well you know I'm going to go and do whatever I want to do regardless of what the incentives are but if there's no way for you to make a living doing that mm -hmm. then essentially you have to choose between maybe curtailing your vision a bit and doing something that's a bit more palatable to the way you know the incentives work so in the current environment, I don't know what that is, but it seems there's a lot of chill out music will get playlisted on um, Spotify, mm. which is there's just dross everywhere. <laughs> it's like you can go to sleep. They they make it so you can also go to sleep to the stuff. They'll be in playlists called sleep music. Chill out, <laughs> yeah. chill out, and what's what's that? I don't know. Netflix and chill. Well, it's not Netflix because you're on Spotify, but um, yeah, a lot of chill out music, but also. When I have friends and they'll say, oh, you know, I've got to add that song to my playlist. And I'm thinking, do you listen to records? Do you listen to albums? Yeah. And I, there's a friend in particular who, um, you know, he listens to quite a, a wide variety of music. He's got a quite an eclectic taste. But he, when I was having this conversation with him, he was saying, oh, I don't really listen to records. And I was like, geez, listen to this record. It's, a, it's an amazing record. And don't just get your favorite song and dump it in a playlist. Sure. Because I guess, you know, back in the day, like I... I'd spend my twenty dollars and buy a CD, and you know when you're fifteen, sixteen, seventeen years old, having twenty bucks to spend on the CD is just a decent amount of money, and you better like the CD. So you spend, you, make you listen choice. to it ten, yeah, you yeah. listen to it ten times, and you work on it. It's kind of you form a relationship with the record, and I, that's definitely been lost. Yeah. So, me and. My dad have really got into vinyl, which I know is a very, it's also a very like hipster thing at the moment is to get into vinyl. But I do think it, it does make a difference buying a, and, and, and you'd have thought it, you'd have thought it would, when you go and buy a record, you, you would have thought because you're spending like 20 pounds to buy a, a vinyl yeah, yeah. that you would um, only pick artists that you know you're gonna really. yeah, yeah. But actually I found that I've discovered a lot more music and, and taken chances on more albums mm. on record than if I was just listening to it on a Spotify because you yeah. would just skip past it yeah yeah and because you bought the record like you said like the I quite like Arcade Fire but their new album it took me a while to get into mm. but because I bought the record yeah I had to just, like yeah it's an investment it. yeah. yeah yeah and yeah I, I don't know I, th I think that's yeah what you're saying there is very similar to 
know, if you go to a, a great museum, right? Like I went to the Louvre for the first time, you know, just by way of example, maybe 18 months ago, and there is so much stuff. You mm. can't see it all. It's so massive. You, so you can, go, you can go try to see it all and not appreciate any of it, or you can go through and try and appreciate some of the stuff. But mm. in order to appreciate some of the stuff, it's not just looking at it and then walking off and seeing the next one. You have to actually stand there and look at it and think about it. And it's the same thing. Is yeah. if, it's, if it's good, it isn't just like a sugar pill where you think, oh yeah, I'll turn that up loud and, and not listen to it. It can go in the background. I think that's the, you know, that's the trouble is, is maybe the, the music industry is now just incentivizing people to just make lounge music. And um, yeah, that's, that's probably not good. Because it will, you know. Yeah. yeah. It's Is probably it... not good. I mean, it's not good for me. No. Because I don't want to make clowns <laughs> music. <laughs> and some people do. You said that um, you have to think about uh, if, you know, you can't necessarily just, just say, I'm just going to make this and whatever happens because you have to make money as well from it. Yeah. Is that something that, that you've actually been through? It's like you've sort of curtailed your vision slightly to... Or, um, not yet, but it is one of those recurring conversations that I think you go through. I've been, I don't know if lucky is the right word, but I, I, I work, so I've got a certain amount of pushback where I'm not depending on music as my sole right. source of income. And that does give you some freedom to say no to certain things. But there is this you know, I don't really want to do what I do for a living. I'd much rather make music. And so you're constantly in this question of like, well, maybe I need to spend more time doing another project that's more kind of commercially focused. And you, you end up with what, like two or three projects running where one is essentially, you know, just a, a shit EDM project, but it'll <laughs> put money in your pocket. Right. And then you can go and do what you really want to do. Is making is making EDM music more interesting than the job I do? Probably. So right, it yeah. might not be a bad thing for me to do. In terms of if I want to keep myself. So are you making shit EDM? No, music? no. But I thought, <laughs> well, maybe I'll just go go make an EDM record. But apparently, someone was telling me EDM's no longer the thing. So um, I, was, I always say I, I I don't know what's the thing. Well, neither. I just so. got I've got to work out what the thing is, and then spend you know. 20% of my time trying to make some money. I, don't know. I, I haven't really thought that far through it, but and it doesn't sound like a great plan the way I'm describing it. I mean, you're not you, selling you sort of it to me. Well, particularly. You, yeah, but you, you, I get what you, you get, get. I get, I you get, get where I'm going, which saying, is yeah. if you want to do your sort of your passion project, maybe you need a, a sort of money maker on the side and that's either going to be a job. Yeah. That, like, or, and, and there's a lot of artists now without necessarily naming them um, that, you listen to their like you know established artists now that you listen to their albums now and you think you could never have made that well you could have made that 20 years ago but you can only make that now because of the music you used to make yeah i don't take so much issue with a, you know a pop focus you know, lot, lots of everyone's favorite bands were pop bands beatles smiths um you know you can go on forever but and that doesn't necessarily mean the the pop music that's being made today is um, is bad. You know, history will kind of determine whether it was bad or not. Yeah. Um, there's plenty of music that ten years on, people are thinking, "How is anyone into that?" Like Dickelback and but you know, the whole massive <laughs> band, and everyone's just like, "Whoa, what happened there? Did everyone just have a brain fade?" And Someone was listening to. I Nickelback didn't get into in Nickelback. For full disclosure, sure, I was sure, not into Nickelback. Sure. <laughs> I bet you got a Nickelback tattoo I, somewhere. Yeah, yeah, it's it's on my bum. <laughs> um, I do distinctly remember one of these one of the Nickelback songs coming on the radio when Dad was in the car and he was just like, "What the fuck is this?" <laughs> it was just some of the lyrics. Oh, I would we, have been, I would we, have been like twelve, and we somehow we somehow ended up at a Nickelback gig. Which oh, did you? How was it? We walked out. How, but how did you end up in there? Did... Yeah, they shot. Oh, wow. They started shooting t-shirts, and we were like, "This isn't for us, is it?" 
So, but, but how did you I go mean, to the gig? I mean, to be fair, I was probably like, how old? At the yeah, time? see, this is the thing. Exactly. But even I then, at that age, <laughs> watching them live was like, nah. <laughs> like, it suddenly all, I suddenly yeah. realised. Yeah. But I guess, you know, I guess what I'm saying is, is like, you can have pop music isn't, isn't bad. I would consider a lot of, you know, some of the stuff that we write is quite pop. Yeah. Has pop sensibility about it. Um, not by today's stance, not Nicki Minaj, but, um, uh, you know, they're, they're great bands of pop bands and um, it'll be history that decides yeah. what pop of this era is good and what isn't good. And, uh, but I guess that's sort of a kind of related issue in that if the, the medium through which people are listening is, is changing the music, then, um, if, and if that medium persists, mm. then, you know, in 20 years time, when Spotify has been the only way that people have listened to music for 25, 30 years, does that kind of change the culture of music and, you know, sort of a self-fulfilling, the medium fulfills its own yeah. kind of purpose, which is to create this music and everyone's like, oh, well, chill out's the only kind of music that exists these days because everyone lost their imaginations. <laughs> it could happen. It could happen. There were, My girlfriend's at music college and uh, apparently they were talking in a lecture about how a lot of record companies now are investing in uh, like AI, like the big ones, like Sony and stuff. Uh, yeah, AI. Like AI, yeah. like writing yeah. computer-made songs. Yeah. Which... Which we had, a, so we had a bit of a debate about because I was like, I don't think it will. I ultimately think that like people won't like it. I think people want someone to it, even if it, even when it's like Taylor Swift music or mm. it feels like throwaway pop music. Those people are still attracted. Those people because of like who they are, mm. not necessarily their throwaway pop songs yeah yeah it's a it's funny when I was watching a like a playback of an Australian football rules game the other day and I reckon on they you just watch it on the on the website I don't know if there's a similar thing here but um, they have these bits of music in between the, the breaks and stuff and I noticed the other day I was like geez, this is really fucking bad music because they used to have on songs that I was familiar with right it wasn't Great, but I know that it yeah. was an actual artist making the music. And now I reckon it's probably just one guy who works for the company churning out, we want a rock song, we want a, this type of song, and they just yeah. churn it out. So it does raise the question of whether that sort of AI model of creating music that's not great but can fill a purpose, which is when no one really cares about what the music is, it's just this kind of placeholder they then put that in and don't have to pay any money for it whereas they used to maybe you say yeah, if our song point. was that little that. 15 seconds maybe we get paid a thousand dollars now they don't pay a thousand dollars it's just yeah. the algorithm um, and then you remove an income stream from artists and it, it's you know if you go into your job tomorrow and someone says or your boss says to you you cut 10% of your pay yeah. You know, you go, well, fuck, am I going to keep doing this job? Yeah. Maybe I'll go try and find a job somewhere else. And and that that's this kind of, you know, it's these micro erosions on, on income that are potentially there from that. So it doesn't need to... Yeah, because I was thinking of about it in, like, the sort of broad terms of, like, that being chart music now is just, like, computer-generated. Mm. But it hadn't even... Probably because I'm not in your line of... But yeah, but I'm not a, you know I'm not a new musician, so it wouldn't have necessarily occurred to me that mm. that would be a thing. Yeah, but it does make sense, and you. Yeah, you know, well, it's it's I I I, it's I, worrying, I agree with it's you. It's worrying, whatever. I don't like the idea of it, whatever. Really. Yeah, but I, I agree with you, right? In that, no one's or people probably won't fall in love with an AI song. Mm. It'll be gimmicky. They might be happy to put it on a party, but no one's going to be going, 
and wanting to meet the person that made the AI algorithm and <laughs> made the song, right? Yeah, yeah. Like, you know, we have fans that will come up to us and, and, and speak to us because there, there's, a, there's a personal connection with the music. Um, so that will, that will exist, but the, the issue will be whether, you know, again, I guess that sort of incentive question is whether there'll be enough people incentivized to make good music because that's the other thing is that you need, you need so many people doing it because 99% of them are going to fail and, mm. and you need lots and lots of people putting this creative effort to make good music so that one of, or two you know, in a hundred can go on to be, become great bands and, and make a difference. And everyone else is you know, just sort of a, a road warrior or never in there. Yeah. And, and that's it and that's all, you know, that's all we might ever be and that's kind of fine. But if you stop 50 of those people from doing it, then maybe you only get half in a hundred and then maybe it takes longer for these great artists to emerge. And then you've got a problem. Mm. And so that's the kind of incentive thing. Well, that's the way, I, that's part of the problem as I see it, is um, just reducing the pool of talent. Why, why would kids go and learn guitar now? Mm. If, you know, there is no one in the world standing on a stage holding a guitar, playing to 10,000 people. Yeah. You know? Yeah. That's a loose end, but you know. <laughs> it's a that's somber right. name. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I wanted to ask you actually about, because you said about you, you work as well as doing music mm. um, and how you how you balance that because obviously I'm I'm working I mean I don't know what you do for work but I'm working so it's sort of in a similar field to where I want to be so it's not you know yeah. I can't complain about it that much yeah but it's also you know trying to juggle with my other projects that I'm trying to do outside of work yeah yeah so yeah I was just wondering how 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 you deal with that? Um, I, I guess probably not that not that well in that I kind of resent have a lot of resentment towards my work because right. I feel like I would, yeah it's not what I want to be doing and when you know you don't want to be doing something it's just purely for money yeah it's really not sure good. it's not great. But then I can't complain because I'm sitting in an office, whereas there were plenty of people just working for money in a coal mine, right? So I'm kind of, I, I'm not, yeah. you know, I'm sort of philosophical about it. I've got it pretty good, but, um, and it is also quite disconnected from music. So I'm, I'm a lawyer. Um, oh, really? And I went and studied law because I was kind of like, well, I don't know what I'll do. And the, I, I sort of only worked it out after we finished this record and I kind of, well, the, mo the most recent one, Echoes in Blue. And I remember when I was like, I was probably 15 or 16 and I was playing in this high school band with Jez, a bass player. Mm -hmm. We've been playing together for a long time now. And I think I said to mum and dad, oh, they, you get to that age, you know, where, I don't know if you had this conversation, what do you, what do you actually want to do? You're in maybe, you know, the second last year of school. What are you thinking? I was like, I want to be a musician. And they're like, <laughs> no, <laughs> wrong, wrong answer. Pick again. And I was like, well, that's what I want to do. And dad was like, no, oh, well, that's, uh, that's going to be expensive for me if you decide to do that. Right. So I kind of was like, oh shit. All right. Well, I probably shouldn't do that. And that's sounds very irresponsible. Sorry, I can just see you laughing at me. <laughs> And my parents have been very supportive of the whole music, you know, endeavor. I was allowed to rehearse in our garage in the evenings from six o'clock until nine o'clock for three or four years whilst they were trying to eat dinner. So mm -hmm. very good about it. But I, I, I feel like this, there's this big chunk of my life where I, I sort of didn't really do what I wanted to do and was kind of, trying to make sure I, I, 
I don't know, did something responsible, which sounds really gross, but, um, or it's unromantic anyway, right? <laughs> so I went and did a law degree and then became a lawyer and the whole time I've been doing band on the side and it's primarily what I, what well, is what I want to do. Right. But yeah, anyway. Yeah. yeah. I, I, mean, I, I, I wouldn't change anything, it's, it's, it's fine, but actually I, I, maybe, I would, maybe I would change some things, but um, I don't like to kind of look back and be like, fuck, I made a big mistake. I'm just like, all right, you know, it's not, you know, it's not what you want to do. So just don't keep doing it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You just got to work to <laughs> yeah. focus on the stuff that. It's a fun one because I, I, sometimes when I'm really deep in my little, little, you know, moment of being like, God, I don't want to be in this office. I'm just kind of like, just fucking chill the fuck out and, you know, stop me from cry baby but at the same time it, it you do need to remind yourself if if that's not what you want to be doing the, don't do it because we're like historically incredibly fortunate to have essentially be right on the edge of being able to do whatever the fuck we want to do right mm. pretty pretty close maybe in a hundred years people can just go and do whatever the hell they want to do um or maybe not maybe no one will have a job and they'll just watch Netflix the government will just pay them to watch it's Netflix Spotify yeah, <laughs> yeah or Spotify right or play computer games because the robots took all the jobs um, but uh, yeah so I guess what I'm saying is, is a lot of people have worked their whole lives without the opportunity to go and do what they wanted to do because it, it isn't even remotely possible Where it, so when it is sort of remotely possible yeah. or just you know, there's a good prospect of doing it. You've sort of got to go and do it. Yeah. Um, in some ways. So were you recording the, like when you were like writing and recording the album and stuff, was that like, like after, like were you doing like a day at work and then going to the studio or? Yeah. So we'll, like get a bit of leave. So I had a, yeah, a bit of leave saved up. So I took two blocks of, it was like a week and a half off work and then the rest of it was done weekends and evenings right. and the, <laughs> the worst of it was well, the this was kind of a great moment in that we were so delirious by the time we kind of sorted it out but um the first single we released off the record blood um just took us a long time to get the vocal feeling right so i think i did maybe two or three different sessions or maybe a couple of hours each where we were sort of getting there, getting there. And then it was at about midnight one night, the other guys had gone home that Malcolm who produced the record and I, we just got the whole thing and it was amazing. We were just like, there it fucking is. And we just walked out and that was it. Yeah. And then we sent the track off to get mixed and we're getting the mixes back and the vocal had this distortion on them. And we're thinking, where the, where the hell is it? And we're asking the mix engineer, can you take the distortion off? And he comes back, he's like, oh, it's actually on the track. Uh, so at some, somewhere along the line, you know, we've been in the studio for 15 hours and maybe the preamp's a bit too loud. So there's distortions got into the, into the mix, but the performance was exactly as we wanted it. And well, so we were pretty, pretty devastated. And we went back to try and redo it, but we had to do it on like a Wednesday night after work. So we started it maybe 10 o'clock at night and work through it about 4 a.m. in the morning, trying to essentially recreate this vocal performance. And we didn't get there. My voice was just wrecked and, and both of us had to kind of work the following day. And it just wasn't right. And it was, anyway, what we worked out was the way the mix engineer had been EQing the, the, um, the vocal mix was not well suited to both the performance or, or the way my voice sounded. So Malcolm, the guy that was producing it, ended up mixing the song and it, it, that vocal take, the distorted one is on the, oh, okay. is on the final right. recording, but he just mixed it in a way that made it work. And the song almost became about itself. It's, it, a, the, lyrically, it's a bit of a kind of tongue in cheek um, uh, reference to this well, it's not fallout. I just quit my job because I couldn't get leave to go on tour. Right. My, an old job. Um, and so it's a sort of a tongue-in-cheek uh, song about that. But then it kind of became about itself in that 
it was such an exhausting process just to get it finished that you know, yeah kind of the sort of blood sweat and tears um to use that phrase Just, I just read my book. Like, I was doing research last night and just writing down questions. I've just seen a question that's just terrible. <laughs> it's just, it's <laughs> what, just what? you got to tell me what the question is now. <laughs> no, but it's just a note that says performing, right? Question mark. No, uh, dash stage fright? Question mark. <laughs> oh, yeah, <laughs> Why yeah. is that? A, I don't know. So ignore that. Unless you do get stage fright. In that case, it's a brilliant question. But otherwise, we'll move on. No, no. I, no. I think you kind of play... Yeah. Don't, don't even, don't even, okay. don't even, All right. it's, it's not All right. worth an answer, that question. That's terrible. <laughs> so listening to your, so we sort of discovered you around this album and then have sort of listened backwards. Yeah. Um, the first EP is very different okay. in sound, is it not? Oh, no, no, no. It's, <laughs> it's, I, I'm, no, take, take. I mean, not, it not in a bad way, but like just there's like an interesting sort of evolution it's the the first EP is like very synth heavy yeah and there's still a lot of synth on the new album but there's a lot more guitar and yeah I was just wondering about the sort of evolution or is it not really it's probably not a conscious thing but yeah so I'm trying to think of how that sort of would have would have emerged I there was probably kind of a, a more of a difference between say the that that EP movements EP and the first record where guitars became a bit more of a focus and I I was starting to write more on guitar so right. we'd have sessions and I would I would play guitar and in the writing sessions I'm not a very good guitarist so I don't really I don't play much of the guitar on the on the records because it takes me forever to nail it but I I, I can I can write on guitar and I guess that was probably where that started started changing was I was participating more in writing the instrumentation um, or the guitar instrumentation as well as the vocals, whereas previously it would have been like Sam would write the keyboard parts and Jez would write his bass lines and Lee would play the drums. So, and I'd just do vocals. So that's probably how that started changing and that was probably more because, I don't know, I felt yeah. like it. Yeah. It wasn't so much, oh, we need... We need to be a guitar, have more guitar in our music. It was just I wanted to play more guitar, and for that to be be a thing. Yeah, yeah. I've I've never really been a kind of you know so there's you know there's a lot of new wave music that is almost solely synth focused, like Depeche Mode and um, um, Pet Shop Boys really aren't probably a bit more than that but like Ultravox and yeah. that era of bands that it, I was always more interested in the bands that were of that era but were, were playing guitars like Joy Division and, and the Smiths and New Order are interesting because they kind of cross over into all of that and New Order was one of those bands that we were all really into when we were starting out so um, yeah I guess that was I feel like What we're doing now is really close to my per my personal influences than right. what we were doing initially, and that's not doesn't mean I don't like the old stuff. No, no. But yeah, that's maybe just a sort of subconscious thing that's been going on sure. through that. Yeah, because the, the the newest you do think sort of Joy Division -y, like on the newer stuff. Yeah, like, it's yeah. Not, there's a you know. It, you can you can hear though when you say those bands like not surprising that they're like an influence. Yeah, is there? yeah. Is it is it is a funny one because with with influences because most people when say if someone comes to your show and they say oh, I love your music you sound like so and so you can sometimes be like oh well, I don't want to sound like anyone I want to sound yeah, like yeah. me right they it's always the case that someone is finding something there's a, there's a train of thought or a, a a train of emotion that they're kind of connecting with and have connected with in the past sure. and why they're drawn to you. So it is a funny one because sometimes you like I read interviews of artists I really like and they they've spoken about this where they really want to shirk the influence. It's like well, you can't really just it's there. Yeah, yeah. Just because someone's saying you, you guys sound remind me of this, it's not. It's a compliment. 
Yeah, because right. it, it might be something as small as because you've got quite like a low voice on a lot of the stuff. Yeah. So yeah. it's quite, you can hear, you know, people, it would be easy to go like, oh, it sounds a bit like Ian Curtis, but like, it's, you know, but, it's, but again, no, I no. can see it's like, uh, but like, no, no, it's, it's I don't mean it in a bad way, obviously. It's just funny, it, I, it's, this kind of conversation has reminded me of Jez is standing in the room and I played in this battle of the bands when we were probably in year 11 and at, I don't know if you at this battle of the bands the, the judges would make notes right and one of the notes was singer sounds like Ian Curtis and I was like who the fuck's Ian Curtis so I was like 16 <laughs> years old and so I looked him up and I was like no I don't <laughs> <laughs> and that was the first time I'd ever heard of Joy Division off a judge saying yeah that I sounded like Ian Curtis and yeah, it's a. I, I, I don't know. You're, I think you're always more sensitive to your own, to the things sure. that make make you different. Yeah. And so you kind of see those far more clearly than someone else who's never heard of your band before will hear those. Yeah. They hear it. As, yeah, sure. You know, they don't they don't see that as you do. So that's I guess where that maybe the. Maybe that's why certain, yeah, because certain you artists just, you shirk, just, you, shirk the influence. And you just try. hear you. You don't hear yeah. You don't hear everything else that 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 comes with someone. You know, when you listen to music, I guess you bring a certain you bring a certain baggage with you of all the other music that you listen yeah. to and that yeah. you like. Yeah. And so when something falls into a yeah, humans like to categorise, don't they? So that you yeah. can fall, you can put people into a certain like oh yeah, yeah they're that kind of yeah. thing. Yeah. But yeah, I guess if you're if you're the person that they're putting into a box, it's, <laughs> it's not as good. Yeah, what's um, what's Howard Moon say? Don't put me in, don't put me in a box. Who's trying to put you in a box, Howard? <laughs> Any concluding thoughts, questions? Any cleaning thoughts? Well, don't write questions at eleven o'clock at night. Is the <laughs> well, you might have thing. I'm uh, didn't Keith Richards write the. Um, guitar riff to satisfaction when he's just about to go to sleep. Wow. Yeah, yeah but you Keith, Richards, Keith Richards is a different beast to me. Too. Yeah, but you yeah. might you might be the Keith, Keith Richards of journalism. Of podcasting. Of podcasting. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. You never know. Yeah, it's that question that you ask at the right time might, you know. Something I've asked uh, a lot of people that I've interviewed is whether they like being interviewed. Um, and you can be honest if you don't like being interviewed. Oh, it totally depends on who the person is okay. interviewing me. Because I've right. had, it's, the worst thing is when you get the questions that you know they're asking every single person they're interviewing. Yeah. Which and is it's, not, it's not bad to have trains of thought, but it's like verbatim. They yeah. just put your name in or your it's album so in. Hair. Yeah, it's just fill in the blanks and then you're like, all right. Yeah, because yeah, I'm, like I'm very conscious about not wanting to... I'm conscious that a lot of the people who do my podcast do a lot of interviews. Yeah. And I don't want to make it very... I don't want it to be a repetitive sort mm. of... So you probably know... I've probably not actually asked you much about your music. Yeah. Um, Which is fun. But that's sort fun. of a conscious, like... You know, I don't want you repeating about you know what the album's about and yeah so, yeah just because it's like yeah not fun for you yeah so. and it, yeah you do end up getting re recycled answers the answers do sort of get better though because you go through say five or six interviews and like just wouldn't say that again but and then you kind of get better yeah, at yeah. framing it but you get this kind of like boilerplate response to a you get a scripts. certain question and yeah i i think the interviews i i most enjoy doing are the ones where it's not question answer question answer and it's sort of a back and forth like a podcast or a live to air radio interview where there's limited scope to kind of hide yeah and you're really just back and forth in conversation like yeah. one of my favorite podcasts actually is very much that so it's a, this economist in the states will um, read an author's book does one each week so he reads a book a week and then he interviews this or the author and it's just a chat yeah it's yeah, just a yeah. chat about the book and he will have some touch points that he wants to get to and that it's maybe just his underline and gone that's a point that I want them to speak more on because they haven't really sure fleshed it out as I'd want them to but that's kind of what I find to be more interesting as a listener anyway is not the whole kind of yeah yeah, yeah. exactly yeah 
Cool. So, and that, and I've enjoyed this interview. Well, I'm glad. I mean, that wasn't a set up question to <laughs> no. get you to say you enjoyed Five it. Five stars. Which, Five stars for in, interview enjoyment. Well, I mean, I haven't great. touched my dinner. Yeah, which is that's great. true. But then I do feel bad about that at the same time. So. But that, that's you, Norman. As in, you feel bad. I feel great. Well, that's good. <laughs> that's good. <laughs>so there you have it jack burke my thanks to jack for doing the show and uh echoes in blue is available in all good record stores go and pick it up it's a great listen thank you for listening to the podcast um in episode seven i will be talking to two-time superbike world champion and lead singer of the band toesland james toesland so as usual if you like the podcast please leave a rating uh subscribe and if you want to be extra generous then go and chuck us some money at patreon.com forward slash the last line thank you for listening i will see you next time i'm james albarn and this is the last line